Summer Concert. I am Garrett Hope. And this is Kurt Kinnett, your composers for this evening. We're very glad you are here joining us tonight. First important announcement. The bathrooms are down this hall, so if you need to use them during the concert, we'd like to ask you to walk outside through the courtyard and go in through the other door instead of walking up the side. And as you can see, we are recording tonight, so please make sure your cell phones, pagers, if anyone still has those, are off. <laughs> Uh, I'm the music director at this amazing parish that has a real deep commitment to music. Um, this concert was made possible tonight by the generous donation of one of our parishioners, Martha Davies, really helped pay for this whole event to happen. So I want to publicly thank you, Martha, for, for making this. <laughs> And uh, because I don't believe in, in concerts being longer than they need to, we're not going to take an intermission. The string quartet and I are going to step off, off the front for just a minute to get a glass of water, so you'll have a chance to talk to your neighbor about how good Garrett's piece was. <laughs> but we're not going to do a full-blown intermission. So to get started, we've invited Dr. Stephen Buehler to give some introductory remarks to set these two women in context for you. I hope you enjoy the concert. Thanks for coming. It's glorious to be here, it's glorious to see all of you, and it's uh, glorious to be uh, part of uh, this amazing event. Joan of Arc was a woman primarily of action. Julian of Norwich was pro a woman primarily of contemplation. The quintessential Martha and Mary of their times, their lives briefly overlapped in the early 1400s. Both of them were products and contributing architects of late medieval European culture. Both were women of deep prayer and deep insight. Both were visionaries. To be a true visionary, however, it is not enough simply to have visions. One must share them and act upon them. Joan and Julian did so. Joan envisioned France as a state called by God to be independent of other nations and empires. She helped to make that a reality resisting English rule militarily and placing the Dauphin, the French heir apparent, on the throne of France. For her courage in taking up the supposedly masculine work of battle in service to that vision, France embraced her as a saint long before the Catholic Church would, nearly 500 years after her death. In the preface to his play about St. Joan, Bernard Shaw saw in Joan's visions a harbinger of Protestantism, as Christian churches increasingly became nationalized, as with the Church of England and its spin-offs, and then became a matter of congregational and even individual identity. Others have seen her as an early exemplar of national self-determination and, of course, feminism. Julian envisioned God's triune identity as inclusive of the feminine, especially of the maternal. God the Mother is as central to her theology as God the Father, perhaps even more so. Perhaps in response to her visions, perhaps as a precaution against the plague, she became an anchorite, someone anchored to a specific place, not necessarily a remote one. She inhabited a cell attached to St. Julian's Parish Church, likely the source of the name given to her, in the East Anglian city of Norwich, then the second largest metropolis in all of Britain. There she prayed, participated in the sacraments, and provided counsel that included advice to another medieval visionary, Marjorie Kemp. The 20th century contemplative and activist, Thomas Merton, recognized Julian as the greatest of English mystics and also one of the greatest English theologians due to her comprehension of God's love in and through creation as well as in and through redemption. We have access to some of Jones and Julian's words because of their great, shared, though different, sufferings. Joan was examined by the church under suspicion of heresy and witchcraft. Julian survived bouts of crippling, excruciating illness. Joan's own testimony in the official record provides countless examples of her personal and spiritual strength and understanding. 
Julian's work, Showings of Divine Love, recounts her physical and spiritual trials and shares her astonishing insights into the nature of divinity and being that somehow grew out of those hardships. Joan demonstrates fierce faith in God even under the threat of the fire that would indeed take her life. When asked if she considered herself to be in a state of grace, she replied, as you will hear in part six of our first composition, if I am not, may God put me there. And if I am, may God so keep me. Commentators over the centuries have pointed to the exchange as demonstrating Joan's strategic instincts, triumphing over a scholastic trap. But it can also be seen and heard as a sincere question, searching for the conditions of Joan's faith, followed by a confident answer with all the confidence placed upon God himself or upon God herself, as Julian suggests, detached from the world, but ever mindful of its sufferings and cruelties, as well as its blessings and beauty, Julian observes God's grace, God's nurturing, God's ongoing redemptive work. In one of her showings, her shared visions and conversations, she recalls, and this passage in a slightly different version can be found near the top of the last page of your program, the Lord showed a little thing, the size of a hazelnut, which seemed to lie in the palm of my hand, and it was as round as any ball. I looked upon it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what may this be? I was answered in a general way thus, it is all that is made. I wondered how long it could last, for it seemed as though it might suddenly fade away to nothing, it was so small. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasts, and ever shall last, for God loves it, and even so has everything being by the love of God. Let us hear this again, and let us hear more, tonight and going forward, from two remarkable women.
if it had been much possessed by the fiends. And after this, the upper part of my body began to die so noticeably that scarcely had I any feeling. And then I expected truly to have passed
Thank you.